Welcome back, Day Camp friends, to season two of the Day Camp Pod. I'm Andy Pritikin, director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, northwest of Chicago. I'm Aaron Glockstein from Camp Robin Hood, uh, also located just outside of Toronto. I don't know why I said also. And we are Day Camp professionals joining forces to provide a forum for Day Camp people like you to share ideas and best practices all across North America and beyond. And for today, we have an amazing interview with the one and only Audrey Monkey, coming all the way from California, right? Hello. Hey, Audrey. <laughs> and um, yeah, so she would be our second Californian because we, um, we had the folks um, from the camp in down in San Diego. That was, that was pretty cool. Stuart Jones' wife, her first name eludes me for a second. Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. She was awesome talking about free play. That was a really, really... Uh, cool one. So anyway, for today's Go Camp Pro podcast, it's sponsored today by um, American Camp Association, New York and New Jersey, dedicated to preserving, promoting, and enhancing the quality of the summer camp experience. Uh, they have awesome professional development opportunities all over the place throughout the fall, and of course, the big mama tri-state camp conference uh, in March in Atlantic City. So check them out, ACANYNJ.org. So Audrey, what we love to ask people when we really don't know them is we love hearing camp origin stories. Like, how did you get into this racket? And I read the first part of your book. Uh, for those people watching on YouTube, I'm going to be shamelessly plugging Audrey's book because it's awesome. Um, so I sort of know the story, but go please tell our listeners. I, um, I had kind of a varied, as a child, I was not a, um, like a camper at one particular camp. I actually grew up going to several different, I went to some Girl Scout camps. I went to um, a tennis camp. You know, I just kind of drifted around. One summer I spent at Gold Arrow Camp, which is the camp where I am now. I went with a friend um, and this was before I moved to, to Newport and this friend had invited me to come. Loved it, had a great time, but never ended up going back. And I think looking back, it was kind of a marketing issue for the camp. I think they probably lost our address when we moved or I just, I don't know, my friends were doing something else. And so I just never ended up going back as a camper. So I only spent one year as a camper at Gold Arrow. And then in 1986, I was a sophomore at Stanford University, and I thought I wanted to be a teacher. I knew I wanted to do something with kids, and so I went to the Career Center, and this was way before the internet, and so they had these big binders full of the brochures from different camps, because I thought, oh, working at a camp, that would be a great way to spend my summer. And I'm flipping through the brochure, or the binder, and I get to the Gold Arrow Camp brochure, and I was like, oh my gosh. I remember this camp. It was so much fun. I loved it. <laughs> I'm going to apply here. So I applied and um, the job I applied for because I was well qualified was as a boat driver and water ski instructor. So my first job at camp in the summer of 1986 was um, driving boats and teaching kids how to water ski. And I, oh my gosh, and I think this part is in the book. I got there and I was like, what? have I been missing? This is where, this is so much better than, <laughs> than life outside of camp. I loved that summer. I loved the community, loved working with kids. I actually really liked the aspect of working with kids that wasn't so confined like it would be in a classroom. I liked being able to coach them on life skills and just get to know them and talk around the campfire. So anyways, that was kind of, that's kind of where it all started was that um, the boats and the, the loving the kids and it's never have missed a summer since 1986 now. Right. And then in the book, you talk about what, what a lot of the people of our generation who have gotten into camps in, in regards to like being directors and owners, it was a situation where you, you sort of got right place, right time with someone that wanted to get out. Right. I mean, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. I always, you know, what I tell the story, I mean, it's definitely, I could not have planned it, put it that yeah. way. This was definitely kind of a meant to be situation. The, the right. timing was kind of uncanny. The founder of the camp, Manny Vizi, passed away in December of 1985. The guy that right. lost your address when you were a camper. Yes, correct. <laughs> his, his wife was more the business side. He was like the fun being out in right. camp kind of guy. Uh, so it was, I don't know, I, I blame her, I think. For <laughs> Anyway, so he had passed away in 1985 in December. So 1986, my first summer working was actually his first summer not being there. So how crazy is that? Like, that's a weird um, yeah. kind of thing, you know? So, um, so yeah, so it, and then um, the, his wife um, 
was still operating it, although she had some great like people who had been around for a long time because she was in her 70s by that time. And so it kind of was all the time when I was in high or in college working there, the, there was a lot of talk about her selling it and who was going to buy it and people would be coming through and we'd be like, oh, is that person going to buy the camp? And it was sort of like my whole time working there as a college student, there was always kind of the speculation about what was going to happen to the camp. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, yeah, that, so so how so this was obviously before your five kids. So at what age were you like a camp director? Well, so officially, when I first bought the camp, which was in 1989, actually, I You're turned twenty. I turned twenty two oh. during the process of escrow, um, but I was not the camp director at that point. I was the assistant director. I had a wonderful mentor. Um, his name was Ken Baker. Actually, he, he passed away from brain cancer in 2009, but he was like my hero. Like he was the guy who hired me and was working very closely with Manny and Jeannie to run the camp. So he was kind of effectively the camp director during my years as a counselor. So he was part of kind of my deal of buying the camp. He was part of it. He was my partner to start off with. And so he was officially the camp director and I was his assistant for the first couple of years. Um, so I had a really great guide, you know, in him. And he had, he was a real entrepreneurial guy. So he had a lot of other businesses going on simultaneously. So he was a great mentor. And he also like, I had to do a lot of stuff and figure it out on my own anyway, even though he was there. So it was kind of good because it wasn't like he was doing everything. He was there for me when I needed him, but I had to learn everything. Wow. That's pretty awesome. So I think it was by the time, I think there was a rule and maybe there's still a rule, but there is a I rule. I think I was remember, 25, ACI. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So by the time I was 25, <laughs> yeah. So that was the thing I remember going, um, do you remember they used to have that certified camp director? Yeah. No, they still have it. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it's called something different now, but it, we, we, it's, in, it's in the list of like the um, prerequisites to be a camp director. It's like the first right. line, so you gotta be 25. Well, I did that. I went yeah. to that when I was 25. <laughs> and, um, and by that point I was the, the camp director because Ken had, was still, he would come for part of the summer, but he was not there full time anymore at that point. He would kind of stop in and help out, but he was not the main person. So at that point I was on my own. And where is Golden Arrow compared to like, like the nearest city, like to LA? Like how, what um, direction is that? <laughs> so we're actually closest to the city of Fresno. So mm -hmm. most people, when I try to spot us, we're, we're south of Yosemite and north oh, wow. of Kings Canyon in the Sierra National Forest. So, so we're kind of there. a middle, central California. So, yeah. um, so we actually, you know, a lot of our campers come from Northern California, Southern California. So we have buses that bring kids from both of those places, from as far south as San Diego and as, then as far north as San Francisco. So you so, couldn't turn into a day camp. You'd have to service coyotes and things <laughs> if you were going to be a day camp. Uh, yeah, nobody yeah. lives, there's hardly <laughs> any children who live full time where our camp is. In fact, I mean, just, it's pretty remote. We're 65 miles northeast of Fresno. So mm -hmm. if you want to go to a movie, it's an hour and 20 minutes to drive. So you're not, you know, so it's, we're in the middle of the forest, basically. Yeah, keeps the staff there at night, certainly. Yes. So for, for people who live in humid New Jersey and windy Chicago and, and cold snowy uh, Toronto, um, we're still pretty damn envious of, of where you're at there, <laughs> uh, even though maybe they don't know her. And, and just one thing from your book at the beginning where it, it talks about how you grew up. Um, my daughter's uh, 23, almost 24 now. And, and like you wrote in a book, like doing everything possible not to work in a cubicle for the rest of her life, right? Yep. So for all the camp professionals that are listening, you know, we do, you know, may not make a lot of money, but we do work pretty hard in a cool situation, you know, that we're lucky for. So you guys may be asking, like, why in the world do we have this sleepaway camp lady on, uh, on the day camp pod? And it's because um, before I knew Audrey, I sort of became familiar with her social media presence because Audrey has created a brand called Sunshine Parenting. I mean, what would you call it? Like a, a, a media empire? Like, I mean, it's like a brand in a way. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure, call it a media empire. Yeah, what sure, let's people? just do that. <laughs> It's a website. It's a it's an e newsletter that sends out a lot of e newsletters. I mean, you do you try to do one a week? It seems like right. Yeah, I fell off over the summer. It was not once a week, oh, but I 
God um, forbid. The rest of the year, <laughs> most of the year it's once a week. And I try to sort of correspond to send out at least when I, because I do a new podcast episode every week. So I try right. to send one out that has right. the new episode. Yeah. And she's up to the, by the way, we're on like episode 20 now. Like she's on episode 120 or something like that. Are you running out of ideas yet, Audrey? <laughs> no. not, even, not even close. And I don't know if you guys are getting to this point, but I have to turn down now people who want to be on it because I have oh, too wow. many, like I'm already yeah. booked through October now oh, wow. for guests, which is <laughs> yeah, really fun. Yeah, but I, um, I have an amazing, like I had um, Paul Tuff, you know, who wrote the book, How Children oh, heck Succeed? Yeah. Awesome. I interviewed him. His his episode is coming out this oh, week. Oh, yeah. I can't wait to hear that. So, um, so I've gotten some really incredible people that I get to chat with that um, that are just awesome. It's like going to a camp conference and hearing a keynote, but I get to just have a conversation with them. So it's That's so much great. fun. All right. So back to the why again here, just so you guys understand this. So day camp people, Audrey, right? In a way, we have an advantage because we are logistically centered amongst our people right? Audrey has created this situation where she's seen as this youth development expert, which she is, and which, by the way, most camp directors are, right? Um, and meanwhile, hers is almost virtual because she lives in California. Her, her camp's in the middle of nowhere, but it doesn't matter because if you're getting e-news blasts and listening to podcasts and going into websites, information is information, and it doesn't matter where you are, right? So whether it's Audrey's community of people that actually go to Golden Arrow Camp or just some mom in Iowa who wants what's best for their kids, you know, and doesn't really know is looking for resources, right? Well, she's created this sort of one stop shop in a way. Um, and, and again, has positioned herself as this youth development person. And I feel that day camp directors in general really miss an opportunity to do this themselves when you're literally in the middle of town of this like virtual town that you've created, right? And I, and I remember being at a, um, a conference once and listening to a speaker who, who said something really poignant that sticks in my brain to this day in saying, you know, you should be able, you as a day camp director should be able to run for mayor in your town. Like you should have that kind of, you know, like ability and, and be that out there in the community and all, right? And I go further with that in saying that we should also be positioned as the youth development experts in this town, the same way the principal of the school, the superintendent, or whatever is, because we are, right? And, you know, Audrey wrote this great book we're going to talk about um, eventually called Happy Campers. And it's, it's a book about um, how what we do at camp completely transfers over to how people should parent their children, right? Helpful, helpful hints. And, um, I try to tell my friends who are not camp people, like they ask what I do and it's, you know, they think I'm out playing kickball with the kids and that's about it, right? You know, what do you do the rest of the year, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, I try to explain to them that, that, you know, I'm consulted by my camp community. Okay, so I have 800 families that send their kids to my camp last year, right? And I'm consulted as if I'm like their priest or rabbi in a way sometimes. And, and they're asking me questions about their kids and how to raise them and they're gonna get divorced and what should I do? I got parents who say, how do I tell my kids we're gonna get divorced, right? I mean, like that's an exceptional position that we're put in as camp directors. So we really should not be shy or humble when it comes to position ourselves as youth development experts because we are anyway, right? So that's why I got Audrey on this podcast, because I want to talk about how you got into the whole sunshine parenting thing and how you started it and, and any tips you have for these camp directors. You know, and every, every camp director is different, right? You, you have camp professionals and some of them are introverts and they're really good at writing and, and hiding in the back, right? Some of them are the people that are going to stand on, on the picnic tables and, and get a thousand people to do what they want to do right? But most people are somewhere in the middle, right? And Audrey, you're really lucky because you have a great personality. It seems like you like speaking in front of people. Um, I say that because sometimes introverts are like, oh, well, I put on a good happy face. But, um, and you write beautifully. So you got like the whole little package, which is nice. Um, so, so how did you start? Where'd you get the idea that you were going to create this, this Sunshine Parenting brand? Well, I didn't really. It was kind of an accidental thing. Really? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like a planned out thing. Um, so basically, I think the trajectory as I look back on it was, you know, you start working at camp. I always had a lot of interest in personal development and kind of 
well-being. So before positive psychology was actually a thing, that's what I was interested in. So that was always the books I wanted to read and, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people and all that kind of stuff. So I had a lifelong interest in this personal well-being, that kind of thing. And so then once I started working at camp, I really started kind of pairing those two and looking at, okay, so what are the things we're doing that, you know, help kids feel more included here? That what are we doing to help them feel more confident? And I started, so as I was doing my job, I was also always researching and reading books and listening to speakers and all this stuff. And it was always about the same thing, which is kind of how do we raise great kids basically? And what are we doing at camp to do that? And then, you know, I started having my own kids. So then I had these kids at camp and my own kids. So it was like both for my own personal growth as a parent and for camp, I still was really interested in this. So I think, I don't know the exact years, but I, guessing sometime in the early, like maybe the mid 2000s there was like an old kind of blogger blog setup that was like blog spot mm -hmm. and i i once found my mm -hmm. old site and it was like this really you know it was like wonky and um i started it i mean it took me like a month to put up the first post i think i put something like maybe you know six weeks later i would spend so much time editing so i hardly was posting anything on it and then in 2012, my friend Anne told me about WordPress and how easy it was and whatever. So I think in 2012 is when I set up my first kind of actual, like more of a website kind of thing. And, um, and I called it Sunshine Parenting only because my camp name is Sunshine. At my camp, we have nicknames and they are so entrenched. I mean, everybody calls us the nickname, whether we're at camp or not. So even in our office here, when we're having a meeting, we're calling each other our camp names. So, <laughs> so it's not just, so I've been called this since we started camp names in 1991. So it's as much of my name as Audrey is. So anyway, I think that, so I, there was not much thought that went into the name at all. It was just, oh, I'm going to share some of these like camp staff training ideas for parents. I'll call it sunshine parenting. I mean, that was really the, the, the how that got started. And I'm, I would have to look back. I could look back at the, the log of when I posted things, but there came a time where I decided I was going to post every week. And that was probably in 2014. So as you can see, as I start talking, you can see why people, this isn't just like wake up one day, oh, I'm mm -hmm. going to start a website and whatever. I mean, so I've ended up, I mean, I'm now up to including podcast episodes, over 400 posts on my site between blog posts and podcast episodes. So this has been years and years of a lot of work. I've put a lot of hours into writing and doing the podcast, but I love it. I love this content. I love being able to synthesize things that I learned. So I'll read a book and then synthesize maybe a summary or write a book review or have the author on my podcast. And I really, really enjoy being able to share with other people like, hey, here's one takeaway from this book. So it really is just because I really enjoy it, why I've been able to do it for so long. Mm -hmm. the, um, so I did the, po so the blog posts, I think I started doing those every week, maybe in 2013 or 14. And in 2016, I was like, oh, podcasts. I love podcasts. I want to start a podcast. So did not know what I was doing, did not launch it. You guys had this whole plan. I, you know, you had your, like now I know I've learned now about how when you launch a podcast, you're supposed to have like three or four episodes ready to go. <laughs> you know, there's this whole science to it. No, I did none of that. I was like, okay. I don't even think I had a real microphone when I started, but, um, and, but I had my first guest, which was one of my favorite authors, Christine Carter, wrote the book Raising Happiness, and I've had her speak at my camp. So she's, um, she's kind of one of my heroes, mentors. So I was like, will you be on my podcast? And she, um, so she came on. So my first guest was Christine Carter. And um, at that, so then I got to the point with the podcast where I was like, every other week, I'll do it every other week, even during the summer. So I banked some for the summer and got all ready. And, and that was probably in 2018. So since then, and then I switched, yeah, so I switched to every week, I think in, at some point in 2018, I've done a new episode every week for now a couple of years, which that is, the consistency is what um, kind of gets people wanting to stay with you because they know that I'm going to be giving them something new every week. So a podcast and, and, and you write, you write a lot. Okay. 
and you're raising, well, I mean, some of them are out of the house now, but you raised five kids, you're a camp director. Do you sleep? Uh, oh my gosh, a lot. Because <laughs> that's, you can ask my I like sleep. Well, I, you know, as you know, I study well being. I'm super into sleep. And if you ask my kids, All I'm right, like good. crazy about sleep. Um, right. No, I sleep a lot, but I will say this um, our camp at this point is quite large. We have a large staff and we have an incredible group of leaders at camp. Well, including your and, husband. Including my husband, yes. Um, and I have really tried to, well, I've needed to, in order to do my other things, step back from a lot of the day-to-day -day administrative aspects of camp. And I actually took camp director off my title as of 2019. And I, my official title is chief visionary officer. Nice. Because the things I really like working on at camp are staff training initiatives, bringing in speakers, um, doing, I do a lot of stuff with friendship curriculum for our campers. So I develop um, assembly things to present as friendship skill. I lead friendship stuff with different age groups. I teach counselors about that kind of thing. So I really am trying to pivot into more of a, almost like a consulting role at my own camp, if, mm -hmm. if you kind of so to speak. Um, and then I actually, like this last summer, I did friendship trainings at two other camps as well. So I've actually now also loved doing that. I got the chance to go to two other camps just in California. And it was so fun to get to share, again, this same stuff. So I love, I love being able to sort of share what I've learned. That's great. We're gonna talk about the friendship thing when we talk about your book, because I think that is super cool. <clears throat> so going back, pivoting back to the, okay, so the, there's a day camp director listening right now in the middle of Indiana, right? Who's like, wow, this is such a great idea. Like, how do I get started? Like the first thing that comes to my mind, I wonder if, if you agree, is you gotta, you gotta keep writing. Just like you said about that blog spot. Like I had a blog spot back in the day too. Like to me, the more you write, the better you get. And it's a really great skill. Now that being said, in 2019, 2020, talking is probably just as viable as writing, right? I mean, yeah. Aaron, please representing our millennials. Aaron, <laughs> how many podcasts do you read compared to how many books do you read, right? I, I, I've actually, yeah, it's true. And it's, it makes, <laughs> it makes the information so much more accessible, um, you know, when, when you can, and I mean, there's something that I do now, which is, which is listen to audio books a lot too. So it's just, right. when you, you can do two, two things at once, it really makes the information uh, more valuable to someone like me. I was, I was listening to a podcast um, with Malcolm Gladwell, and he just put out a new book right? And um, I can't wait to read it. Although he said in the podcast that 70% of the sales have been audiobooks. And he funny. actually, yeah, he actually recorded the audiobook in a really cool way, sort of it's like a podcast. So instead of him reading the transcripts of things, he actually has the actual phone calls, like recordings, and that kind of things. And I'm like, damn, I think I have more time to listen to podcasts in a car than I do to sit down and read a book on my couch. It's, it's phenomenal. I've listened to it. It's really, really good. It is. It listen to podcasts. Yeah. I'm glad well talking to strangers. Yeah, it's really right. good. Audiobook. And I can see that, you know, just, just looking, just looking at your, uh, you know, website, you have this great feature to send an audio, uh, you know, an audio message, which also, again, the accessibility to someone like, you know, me, who's maybe driving and, uh, you know, interested in talking to you is, uh, is, is there with that. Yeah. So going back, Andy, the whole thing about writing, to be honest, people don't really read that much. I know. So, so the writing, I like to write. And for me, it helps me clarify my own thoughts and get things ready. But really, I think what I really should be doing is having like a little YouTube video or podcast about each of the, the topics in my blog post, which, you know, eventually maybe that'll kind of occur where more, there'll be more, more video content. I have started doing little videos at times or, or some Facebook live things. I've toyed with that a little, but I agree. I think for busy parents, the um, just audio things and quick bites of information are really, really more valuable. So I do not think people need to write extensively or expand their writing skills if that's not the way they want to share i think you're correct that everybody has some great resources and expertise to share with parents so it's really just figuring out the delivery method that's most suited to your personality and what you like to do so you can you can be the person that that uh, shares information with parents on 
you know, at the coffee shop once a week or online or whatever. I mean, I really do agree that you can, you can set it up to fit your needs. You can make yourself available as more than just the place where your the kid spends the summer. You can kind of present yourself and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm reading this book. Do you want to get together and talk about it? Um, hey, I found this great podcast episode that really relates to play. I'm going to share it with you. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can present yourself and, and share things with your camp community that don't even require a whole lot of time or work. Right. Well, I think that what you're talking about is it's a lot of stuff. And it's one of the reasons that I'm doing this day camp podcast. It's because I do this already. I've always talked to my colleagues. I'm always offering advice. I'm always finding out new cool things, right? Like you said, you're always reading books and listening to podcasts and reading magazine articles and all that kind of stuff. And you're always sharing it anyway. So why not do it on a real platform? And it all comes back to Instagram stories, doesn't it, Aaron? It's just, you know, that's, but you're right, Audrey, like a two minute thing on whatever the topic is, is probably a great vehicle for doing it. Like your book, you know, the chapters, each chapter is so great. You could do a two minute thing on, on a thought from each chapter and just be banging those things out. And, you know, 35 year old moms would be gobbling them up. Like there's no more, you know, most yeah. thanks for that tip. I think I, yeah, I need to get on. I need to get back in book promo now that camp's over. I'm like back on the book mode. But, you know? but don't you have some, some 20 year old children that could help you with that for God's sakes. You would think they're all over. the place. <laughs> Nobody's in my same state practically. So yeah, but you, that's, that's, that's not important. <laughs> And that's the thing also, you know, when you listen to those, when you listen to those, uh, those short clips or the, or, or, you know, the, a, a short podcast that you can listen to on the, on the way to work. I, you know, when I, when I do that, I, I start my day, you know, feeling empowered, feeling inspired and, and, you know, wanting, wanting more obviously, but wanting to implement and then, um, you know, take the next step. So, uh, so I think it's a great technique. Yeah. A lot of my parents now were kids in my camp and they're looking for lots of advice and like you said short bits of advice and now that my daughter's a parent as well i get a million phone calls on things that you know you never thought about it you haven't thought about in years that they're hungry for mm -hmm. yeah you right. could think about a place to start is what are the questions you answer most and then put that as you know something to share on a video or in a post or something and just put it on your camp's blog or your news or wherever you share things. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. All right, so uh, before we talk about the book, I just wanna thank uh, CRS Commercial Recreation Specialist for being one of our sponsors. Uh, big water trampolines, spray plaid, splash pad people. Um, they're at all the camp conferences, check them out. My man, Rich Wills there, super awesome guy. Um, CRS4, number four, rec.com. CRS is serious about fun. Um, so anyway, the book. All right, so I jumped on this thing right away and it's, it's, it's really been wonderful. And, and you know, even though Audrey says that writing is a lost art, she writes really, really beautifully. And she does a great job of articulating the kind of things that we should be saying to our families, you know, and to our staff frankly. I just want to give you a little snippet. All right. I'm going to embarrass you, Audrey. I'm going to read from your book a little bit. All right. This is from uh, one of the first chapters. She's talking about connections, right? And why it's important to, to make, for kids to make connections. She says, if our campers don't feel accepted, included, and valued, nothing else we teach or do at our camp matters. We could have the snazziest cabins, most delicious food, the coolest zip lines, jet skis, but if we aren't helping kids form connections, we aren't doing what matters most. Right. I mean, the whole book is, is a lot of those kind of things that we think about all the time, um, but we have a hard time saying, right, because they sort of come second nature to us. Um, so how did the book come about? Like, when did you decide you wanted to delve into such a project? Because this has been a project because, you know, I joke around, Audrey, about a media empire kind of thing. But it, it is like you got the Facebook page and you got, and you got the, your Instagram and then you're doing all these different things. And now you're you know, you're running, your family's running a camp in the summer. At the same time, you're basically sort of doing a mini online book tour kind of thing happening to, to promote this book and get people to write reviews and all that kind of thing. She had me try to write an Amazon review, but it, it, it was a, a stupid technicality. It was like, it's a lot of, there's a lot of weird little crap that you're dealing with, right? So, so what was the genesis of the book? Well, I think after, you know, when you start, when you have a website and you've been writing, you know, all these pieces and you realize, wow, I have, you know, I have 300 
1,000 word pieces on a website. That's 300,000 words. <laughs> and then I also, I think what really, probably actually what really inspired me was in, um, this is random, but I went back to school in 2014 or 13. I graduated with my master's degree in 2015. I went back to school specifically. Um, I wanted to get my master's in psychology. And it was something that I had actually started taking classes before my first daughter was born um, down at Pepperdine in Southern California. And then I just never finished it. It was something I always wanted to do. And I found this program. It's just at our local state university, Fresno State, and it was research-based. So the classes that I took the first year were like statistics and research things and ended up being able to do my research at camp, of course. So I had seven camps participate. And I originally wanted to, what I really wanted to prove was that it was all about being unplugged. So I was kind of like, the reason everyone's so happy is because they're unplugged at camp. Well, as it turned out, and I delved into the literature about youth well-being, I really found that there are so many positive variables about camp that you really can't pull just one out without a lot. You'd have to have a control group that has phones at camp. You know, it would just be something that I couldn't do. So there's so many of these elements, but when I really drilled down on what is most important for our kids, it all came down to that connection, positive relationship piece. The positive connections, both in their families and with their peers and other adult mentors is the single best predictor of our kids coming out the other side of crazy childhood and adolescence, you know, in one piece and relatively healthy and happy. So I ended up really drilling down on social skills because obviously in order to make good connections, you need to be able to get along with other people. So for my master's, I had to write a thesis and it included a literature review and all this stuff. So I ended up at the end of my thesis project or whatever master's degree with an 85 Word document that was like bound in a little book. And I'm like, this is kind of cool. I just wrote an 85 page thing. So I think that spurred me on like, well, I could write that. And, you know, nobody reads theses because they're boring because they're a bunch of stats and that kind of thing. So I, at that point, I think that really kind of gave me the, the impetus, like, okay, I can do that. I can hundred percent, I can write a book more in like my, the way I write my blog posts. That's more for like, normal human consumption than academic. And so I think that was really what got me. So I finished the master's in 2015. So I think it was around that time that I started thinking about a book. Well, it turned out pretty decent. Nice. Um, so, so, so what Audrey did was pull out, is it, it's like nine main concepts, right? And a chapter on each. And she delves into each. And then at the end, gives people like useful things to do, including one of my favorite cool little things, sticky notes, she calls it, right? So like write a little, because the, the, the whole book is to be used as a tool for parenting your kids, right? So like sticky notes to write for your kids or to remind yourself of things. And it's just, it's really, really practical. I super love it. And, and you know, one of the reasons I love this book and one of the reasons, again, you're on this podcast is not to preach this stuff to the choir, right? Because the people that send their kids to camp, they already sort of get that. Now, th this is a great benefit for sending your kids to camp because now you can see what we're doing in camp in a way, how intentional we are in camp about what we do. Good camps, at least. Um, but I like this also because we're, we could be preaching this kind of thing to people who don't send their kids to camp. You know, the 80% of Americans that don't send their kids to camp, right? The, the, the silent majority out there. Um, and if we can actually position ourselves as experts like this, talk about it more, get people to go, wow, that camp director actually knows what they're talking about. Um, maybe we can get more kids to come to camp from it too. That's sort of my thought. And you know, yeah. as day camp directors, again, in a local area where you can actually be talking to the PTOs and you can be at the town fair, you know, and that kind of thing, and people can get to know you a little bit. Well, so, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I really did want to elevate the whole camp industry through this. I wanted to make sure that we get the message out there, like you said, that we do a lot more than what people know about what we do. And there's a lot behind what we do at camp. And kids are getting something at camp that they're really not getting other places because other places are not as intentional as we are on the connection, on the character building. Other places have other goals. Schools have to teach academics. Mm -hmm. But at camp, 
we are all about friends. You know, we're like about helping kids make friends. And so where else can people do that? So I really did want to elevate it. I really do want to get it in the hands of non-camp people, like you said, because mm -hmm. it will help them understand why they might want to consider sending their kid to camp. It makes a lot of sense to think about it, you know. Even if your your camp is is on the smaller side of things, you still have to. We're we we're teaching counselors how to be parents, basically, right? And so let's just talk about parents a little bit, and and hopefully not badmouth them a little, because one of the reasons this camp is so exceptional. I mean, excuse me, this book is so exceptional, is that it really distills things and makes things really concrete, right? And you know, we've been around now doing this camp thing for over twenty years. Let's say twenty five years, and you definitely have seen parents change, right? So parents in general, I would say, are a little looser now. They're a little cooler, right? And you don't see as much tough love parents anymore, right? And I think that what this book does is talk about the kind of things that we get our counselors to do, which is to draw lines in the sand and to give them specific tools. So chapter number two, right? Catching the kids doing something right. Right. So that's something that's like super. I mean, there's a whole book on it called uh, what, the five minute manager, two minute manager. Right. I mean, it's but I mean, that's something I, I always joke around with the parents at our new parent orientation and say that we can accomplish a lot more with their kids than they can, maybe because we have a different relationship, you know, because we as parents spend the bulk of our time telling our kids what not to do. Don't do that. Stop doing that. That's dangerous. Like, like that's literally the soundtrack of most kids in their homes with their parents, right? And what Audrey proposes here in this book is to be like a counselor where you have to like balance that and you have to find the good things people do. And the same thing as us as camp directors, we can't just be telling our counselors what's wrong. We have to be telling them what's right so that when we want to help them do things better, they're more apt to listen to us, right? So I think that's a great example of that. Would you like to expound on that for a second? Well, yeah, I disagree and, uh, with the, everything that you were saying that I, one of the things that I really wanted is I wanted this book to be encouraging and accessible. And that's the feedback I'm getting is that people read it and they're like, it doesn't make them, it's not like a book that just makes people feel like, oh no, I'm doing everything wrong. Like, oh, the kids are not going to turn out okay. Instead, it's like, oh, you mean I can just write a sticky note saying something I like about my kid and that sense. will, you know. It's like really, but I know it, it's funny, it's simple stuff. And that was the whole point of it is that just to be encouraging, to be a positive voice in kind of a negative, la a lot of the parenting mm. stuff lately has been about, you know, here's, you know, you're over parenting. So here's all the things you're doing wrong. This is all the bad stuff that's happening to your kids because of it. And I wanted to just have another voice and just say, hey, you know mm. what? You're, everyone's fine. The kids are going to be fine. Just how about just try one thing? Right. You know, just try, you know, spending some time checking in one-on-one -on -one with your kid for well, a minute these, or two. These parents, I mean, and that sounds like such a simple thing, but these parents, if mom and dad both work and they get home at six or seven o'clock, right, and you got to make dinner and they got to do homework and they got to get rushed off to dance and all that kind of thing, you can find yourself not doing a lot of these things, right, of just doing the, the baseline, got to get, you know, being like a sheep herder, which is what we do not want our counselors doing. Right? We want them forging relationship, right? There's something in there about the relation in the relationship chapter. One of the um, one of the the action things is make sure you talk to your kid for like three to five minutes by themselves each day, right? And what a great thing to tell a counselor, by the way, right? And and whether you're at a sleepaway camp and you're with them all day, or even at a day camp where it's seven or eight hours, like that's just a great useful tool, and it makes such an impact. And I say that to my staff all the time because I have kids that come to my camp for only two weeks at a day camp not that long of a time like you have to be really intentional if you want to forge a relationship with people so chapter five this uh, harkens back to we did a podcast with bob dinner that was epic um a few months ago and we were talking about anxiety right and how um you know stress is actually like super important and you need stress to grow right so chapter five is called grit is grown outside the comfort zone right and that's something that we as camp people do all the time like they're out of their comfort zone, like the moment they get to us, you know? And that's why they're so like fungible, like Play-Doh, you know? Um, and, and we see it all the time that parents are too afraid to push the kids out of their comfort zone because they're, you know, they might get upset and they'll be uncomfortable, you know? And that's actually like a thing. Like my son jokes around and goes, I'm feeling uncomfortable right now, you know, because that's like a thing, <laughs> you know? So 
as is as, as is the word <laughs> the word anxiety right yeah just a clutch it's a crutch for a lot of people and then this the last one i want to end with the chapter is chapter six kids are more capable than parents think they are right that's another thing too is that parents are always blown away by what their kids accomplish at camp because we push them harder right um you know and as, as a former music teacher uh, sorry about my dog there as a former music teacher I mean, I had kids improvising jazz as like nine-year-olds. Like you can do it if you give these kids a shot. Like they never fail to, to disappoint on that end. Oh, wait, I got another one. Kids strive with structure, right? And this just goes back to the cool parents, right? And like when you get a counselor and, and they come to your camp, um, generally speaking, if they've never done camp before, they think they're gonna be the coolest counselor ever. And that sort of leads into like, I'm not gonna give them as much structure. Right. And that's completely opposite of what actually is needed is that kids need structure. And by the way, most parents that have kids, there's not a handbook that comes with it. So they feel the same way. Oh, well, my parents are really tough on me. So I'm going to be like a cool parent. Right. And then you get this kid with like crazy behaviors because there's no lines in the sand. Right. So I think that's that's an unbelievable chapter of relevance for today's parents. Um, and then the last thing I just want to touch on is the friendships thing. Right, that coach kids to better friendships. Uh, I worked with Jay Jacobs for about three years, and one of his mantras that he talks about at his camps over and over was building friendship skills. That you know, just like any kind of character skill, it's not an innate thing you're born with. Right? Kids need to learn how to not just be friendly to like make that initial friendship, but how to maintain a friendship and how to stay respectful. You know, through that and not talk behind people's backs and all that kind of stuff like that. Um, and I think that that's a, a big thing that we do at camp. That's like one of our main things we do at camp. And I think that's one of the big secrets that most parents have no idea how to do and that we are experts at and that we really should be making a big deal about. That's what I got. <laughs> I can't wait to go out and get the book. All right, awesome. All right, we are winding down. Um, before we do a little day camp tip of the week, I wanna thank our friends at AM Skyer. For almost 100 years, they have been a strategic partner with summer camps ready to support any needs arising in insurance, legal, PR, health, facility, and more. They're our friends, they support everything the ACA does, uh, and we're very eternally grateful for them. Oh, and they're helping Audrey sell her book too. I noticed too, your buddies at AM Skyer. That's, that's definitely. Yeah, I'm, speak, I'm doing some speaking for them next week in Pennsylvania and then at the MAKE, the Midwestern Association of Independent Camps. So that'll be fun. Awesome. Yeah. Well, now that you're, you're taking on more of this consultant role, they should, they should utilize you for that. All right. So tip of the week. Sam, I see you've got a cheese ball relay. What in the world is that? <laughs> All right. Um, I have some picture examples on the, the show notes um, to explain if I, I'm not clear enough in my explanation. So the counselors put on uh, shower caps, uh, just that you get wherever. Um, you put shaving cream all over them, and their group stands in front of them and are given big bins of cheese balls. And they each get a turn to get all their cheese balls on the head of their counselor because they stick to the, to the shaving cream. So at the end of the relay, <laughs> after everyone's thrown their cheese balls, they get to see which counselor is covered with the most cheese balls that stuck to their shavy cream head. It's Sam, always fun. If, if we do are they throwing them? Are they throwing yes, from, from a like short a distance? Okay. Yeah, right. like if, maybe two feet, three feet. If we do 120 episodes, are you gonna have 120 of these things? Like you have all these <laughs> crazy things like this. Lots of fun activities. Oh my yeah. gosh, that's really awesome. All right. The pictures are beat, hilarious. Aaron, too. can you beat that? <laughs> I definitely can't beat that. <laughs> that's why I'm going to defer to some, to some another resource actually that I yes. uh, uh, that I found just recently, and uh, it's. I haven't heard of it before. Maybe some people out there have heard of it. Uh, it's Playmo, P-L-A-Y-M-E-O.com. Um, and it actually has like a, the first thing you see when you go on the website, it has, you can put in, I, I'm a camp leader and I want my group to do and uh, has a whole bunch of options and there's some really great activities. And so just in the spirit of, um, of uh, camp training and, you know, parenting, but, uh, you know, related to uh, training, um, 
uh, our staff. Uh, just I, I think this is a great resource for sharing with staff uh, moving forward. They have actual, I mean, there is a paid subscription section, but they have a number of free resources here that I that I was that I've been looking at, and you can actually watch these Australian guys do these videos um, that demonstrate the different activities. So there's some maybe some of the maybe not as good as uh, the cheese ball um activity that's oh, that might be on their website you never know but they have some they have some great team builders and uh and, and uh other uh other cool activities and for you know for our staff who are um often not reading and uh not able to you know like we give our bus counselors for example like a whole manual and say like when you're stuck on the bus turn the page to the the next activity and and there's five five things you can try and they never do so i think you know having videos that they can watch um they're more likely to you know check out a video here and uh and, and implement something so this is definitely something i i, I like and i'm going to share with uh uh with my staff next summer well thank you for sharing it with nice. the uh, world because that's that's a heck of an awesome resource Super yeah cool um i want to just say that i have been doing ASL, American Sign Language, at my camp now for about three or four years, starting with five-year-olds. And it has been really successful. Now, you got to have a good teacher in order to do that, no doubt. But kids, these kids, you know, that they're like sponges. They want to learn this kind of thing. And in a day and age now where you go to college, you could take ASL as your language choice, right? Um, it's, it's like a real thing. And... Um, we have kids learning songs and then performing them on Fridays, you know, with, with the whole sign language. And um, it, it's just turned into like a little cult at my camp. And, and you know, going back to, you know, program costs, costs nothing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. As long as you find a staff person that can do it. And I tell you, more and more of your staff are going to come in with this skill because it's, they're, they're treating it just like they're treating French and Spanish and such at colleges and uh, a lot of the kids are, are more enthused to take ASL than to take a more traditional foreign language. All right, Audrey, you got any uh, cool sure. tools? Yes, for sure. So um, one of the things that I thought of that would be really fun and it can be at any camp, day, resident, school, whatever is, um, have you guys ever done where you have a beach ball and you write questions on the different parts of the beach ball? Have you guys already covered that one? Well, no, we didn't cover that one. Okay. I'm just saying well, I have one. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I just think that's a really easy, like if you're waiting for something or, you know, you need to like kill a little time that's really fun and it helps the kids get to know each other. And asking questions is actually one of the friendship skills that we focus on a lot at our camp because kids aren't all, that's a skill they need to learn is asking questions, listening to the response, and then being able to ask follow-up questions. So you just put these different questions and they can be, you know, anything you can, I mean, there's lists and lists of questions. I have a lot on my website, but there's also other ones available and you just write them all on these balls and then you just throw them around and wherever their thumb is, they answer that question when they catch it. So it could be like every fifth throw or the counselor can decide how you do it. But um, really like that as a friendship building. The other thing I was thinking of, do you guys know five things? Have mm -hmm. you guys ever played that? Okay, well then I won't show you that one. I won't sing for you. <laughs> well, that was... you can't say that, Audrey. There's podcast listeners in Andorra right now that are like, "Come on, what?" The okay, heck well is then five you things? have to do it with me. Then if you if you know it, we do it. Five things, five things, five things, five things, five things, and then the person you either can say it can be five things about yourself, very specific, or it can be something like five things you liked about the day, and then after each thing that. Like if I'm the one going, I say something and everyone claps and says one. And then after the second thing, two. And then at the end of the fifth, we all say five things, five things, five things, five things, five things. And the next person goes. But we use it both for introducing people. So you can say, you know, your name, where you're from, what you're at camp, your favorite activity, and your favorite ice cream flavor. And you can have the kids all do it. And so they're getting to know each other. Plus, it's just kind of fun and silly because you're singing and clapping and stuff. So These are two. awesome day camp things, Audrey, because at day camps, I mean, you're a short session kind of thing, right? You have two, three weekers at Gold Arrow, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at, at our camps, you know, we have kids coming in and out all the time. And Monday mornings are super, super important to be doing these things. I'm looking right now on my shelf. I actually have two soccer balls because there's a lot more things than beach balls on soccer balls because those little octagons, you know, or hexagons. Pentagons actually look like. But anyway, um, so, yeah, that, those are great, great tools. Um, 
you know, we, we tell the counselors all the time on Monday morning, hey, play name games with your kids, right? And sometimes they just draw a blank. So to give them these kind of things. And, you know, that little goofy song about the five things, like that could be just one of those things that, you know, hey, well, my counselor did this to me when I was a kid and I remember this thing and they just sort of keep it going. So bravo. I like the clap after each one because it keeps them all paying attention, yes. <laughs> you know, keeps them all engaged. Yep. Absolutely. We had a, we made a video at some point. I don't know if it's still up on our website, but we um, showed the kids how to play this at home. But I think it's I don't know if it's there anymore. But that would be a really easy one to make a little like film the kids playing it and then share it with your families. All right. Well, speaking of websites and stuff like that, Audrey, plug all your media things now. Go oh, give, give me a plug. Okay. Well, my website is sunshine-parenting.com. And basically, if you go there, everything's there. So like if my podcast is on there, um, links to social media and everything. So pretty much just go to sunshine-parenting.com. That's the best one stop and everything's there. Cool. And of course, you can, her book is called Happy Campers. And you can get it on Amazon and any other place that you get books. Um, and Audrey, thank you so much for hanging with us day camp people. You know, This was really fun. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed chatting with you today. That's awesome. Uh, we want to thank our executive producer, Mr. Go Camp Pro himself, Travis Allison, for helping get this show out to you and to our generous sponsors, ACA New York, New Jersey, CRS, and AM Skyer, allowing us to bring this podcast to you. So if you don't want to miss an episode of the Day Camp Pod, you should subscribe on iTunes or wherever else you get your favorite podcasts. And don't forget to show your Day Camp brethren some digital love. Give us some nice ratings, reviews. Uh, check out our show notes um, and the resources. Um, we'll have that... Um, that website Aaron was talking about, um, I think I wrote it down over here, uh, playmeo.com. We'll have it on daycamppodcast.com. That's our hub for all our podcasts. And you can email us questions. We actually got a question last week, I heard, at um, daycampquestions at gocamp.pro. Um, we'll be back in uh, two weeks with some more interesting topics and guests that will make you a better day camp professional and improve your day camp for your campers and your staff. Um, it'll be, uh, the next episode will be the pickles and, uh, <laughs> and we'll be talking about how to bring the sleepaway camp spirit to your camp. Once again, this has been the day camp pod.